I'm an ER doctor, though, so it's not an emergency. But it is for me. Well, it is for you, but that I'm not going to look at your rash. It's raised. I get that. There's fuzz on it. Go see it. That's just because it's where it's at? Yes, exactly, because it's where it's but at. I don't want to look at it. I feel like that's weird. If you're really my brother, No, you should... just start. We'll talk about it later. Go ahead. All right. Well, welcome to the Sights and Sirens Back to Basic podcast, where my brother and I, an ER physician and firefighter paramedic and RN, talk about complicated medical issues and break them down and take them back to the basics. Today's sponsor is St. Patrick's Day because it is St. Patrick's Day. And the luck of the Irish. No. <laughs> You're after me lucky charms. I don't think you it's can. Gonna, I don't think you can just make St. Patrick our sponsor. It's not going to actually be St. Patrick's Day when anyone listens to this either because right. of podcast time travel. It's going to be like a month later. But yeah. But we are recording just, this on St. Patrick's Day. So, yeah, so happy. Cheers. We should have some St. green Patrick. beer or something and been like, oh. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. People okay. like that kind of stuff. Sure. So I guess, sure. Anyway. Our so basically, today. we don't have a sponsor. Today. <laughs> yeah, there's no sponsor today. There's so no Chris, sponsor what today. are we talking about? All right, so today I wanted to talk about the dialysis patient. Um, I want to share a case, and there's, the reason this this got brought up uh, is I had a case the other day of a dialysis patient that I'd like to share. But I think that so talking about dialysis is not like a sexy topic, right? And I think in emergency care and in EMS, we want to talk about trauma and the airway True, and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And sometimes we shy away from these topics that aren't as cool and sexy because they one, seem like they're going to be boring. They seem like they're going to be boring. And sometimes that's because we don't have a deeper understanding of them because getting a deeper understanding is sometimes boring. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It can, it can, it can be, you know, a boring topic. And sometimes it's because we don't know more about it and that sort of thing. So, and like you've told me so many times that like I have this ability to take very mundane medical topics and make them super sexy. So I kind of want to do that today. I've said that. Yeah, I feel like you said that. Let the record show I've never ever said that. I feel that like you've said that a couple times. My brother. That's weird. I think you said that. Nope. Okay. Well, I mean, anyway. So we're going to talk about the dialysis patient. And the, my goal for this is to, again, bring it back to basics like we do and talk about, we know that things happen with dialysis, but let's talk about what actually happens and what it actually it is so that maybe we can leave here and maybe it's still not a sexy topic, but we have a better understanding of it. True. Okay. So the reason I wanted to bring this up because I had this case the other day where, and it was, not necessarily like a complicated case. It was a 65-year-old male who's on dialysis. He's brought in by EMS because he was confused. Okay. So the main complaint, the chief complaint was altered mental status, confusion. So the medic brought him in and, and this medic and I are close. I, I see we do a lot of EMS education. So this is a buddy who I know and he brought him in. He goes, hey, you know, the guy's been confused for the last two days. Um, I think it's because he missed dialysis. And that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. What, what, do, you, what do you think's going on? And I wasn't trying to like quiz him or, or yeah. anything like that. I was just like, like, what do you, you know, I, I totally agree with you. It's probably because he missed dialysis. Why do you, you know, what do you think is going on? And he's like, well, because he missed dialysis. Right. And, and I was that, like, no, no I, I, confused. I agree with you. But like, <laughs> and then that probably is making him confused. But like, what, a, but, but why? Because he missed dialysis. It's your job. You're the ER doctor. Right. No, Figure exactly. Out, and I science, wasn't like, I wasn't, right. <laughs> I wasn't trying to like, you know, like, you know, trick him into like quiz him and try to yeah, pass the test. But, and, but I realized that. And maybe even I, it's, it's like, we know that something's going on when someone misses dialysis. We know that like dialysis brings on a whole new differential diagnosis, but, but what, what is it? Right. We, sometimes we forget like what that is, because again, it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated topic in the sense that if you, we can try to break it down and make it a little bit easier for people, which was my hope for today. But again, we know there's something else when we see a dialysis patient, but I want to talk about what that else is, right? Why it makes sense that he's confused, but why? Right. Let's let's right. let's really make sense of and it. I think we've sort of proven thing. with the topics that we've covered, like we've talked about this before, but like this is what is going to separate you from being a basic provider and an expert in what you do. Right. It's 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 not enough just to know, hey, dialysis patients, when they miss dialysis, can sometimes be confused. Like that's a, maybe a little bit of a step above, but like sure. a deeper understanding of how the kidneys work and what dialysis is and then why, you know, physiologically that creates altered mental status well now i'm an expert in the material and i can again I, i'm better at the more nuanced issues than if i see an issue with a patient who's on dialysis and they're confused and this weird thing's going on i'm more apt to catch those that weird stuff because i i have an understanding of the entire process yeah absolutely and i think sometimes the things we see more often we almost sometimes know less about because they're not as exciting because we see them all the time right yeah. so like you don't see amputations all the time so you learn all about it and it's exciting. You're like, oh man, like that would be crazy. And, but then we see dialysis patients every day, yeah. right? And because yeah. we see them every day, they're boring, they're mundane. There's not much necessarily that we feel like we can do or going to do. 
So we almost don't study it as much or we don't think about it as in as much depth. And again, I think there's an opportunity there for us to kind of dive into it a little bit, keep it simple, but really kind of have a nice picture of when we see a dialysis patient, what are the couple things we need to be looking for and, and, and that sort of thing. And I don't think it's that complicated. Like I, no, right. I think even I don't have as much knowledge as I should when it comes to like electrolyte imbalances and stuff like that. And I think we, in the same way that sometimes in areas of cardiology, we chalk it up to like well, there's a bunch of different things and it's complicated. So I'm just going to use big words and like ignore it, you know, Mm -hmm. like it it really isn't too complicated. There's a a certain number of chemicals in the body. There's a certain number of, you know, how the kidney functions to, to keep fluid balance and stuff like that. So, and you can, you can pretty much as a rule know how those, those chemicals and electrolytes are shifting and how fluid's shifting in the body. Like you can, you can understand that there are clear rules to it. It's not even as complicated as like STEMI identification and sure. stuff like that, mm-hmm. where there's like exceptions to the rules all the time. It is pretty clear cut. Yeah. It just doesn't necessarily directly affect our treatment all the time. And I think maybe because it's more of a science and it's less of an art, we can't kind of BS our way through it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You either know <laughs> it or you don't. To right? sound more like an expert. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, too, and I will openly admit this, is that I even use this podcast and our education and our lectures to freshen up on things that I don't. So, I mean, so like when I first sat down to really kind of hammer out, like, what are the couple things I want to look for in a dialysis patient? What do I need to be? What is, what needs to be in my differential? How do I make this a systematic approach? Right. I, I mean, last week, I remember you telling me you didn't even know what a kidney was. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm like, no, quiet, quiet. That's not, that's not true. Um, no, but again, like I said, I use these opportunities for, for myself as well. So it's not that I like know, know everything about dialysis and I'm like, I'm going to share my knowledge. Like, no, like I want to learn about it too. So I learn about it and then, and then like to share it. So and I think that's all about continuing education yeah, and, and, you know, everyday learning. So, so in order to talk about dialysis, we have to talk about uh, what it's replacing in the body. And basically what it's replacing is it's replacing the function of the kidney. All right. So do you want to share quickly what the general simple function of a kidney is? Yeah. So the kidney will filter fluid. So the, the blood really, mm-hmm. but it mm-hmm. filters the fluid of the body. It removes toxins and, and filters those out and then helps us urinate it out and eliminate those toxins. So exactly. Through, through urine. Exactly. Right. So, so right, again, super simple. I mean, I see there's like some complex, you know, physiology yeah. that goes in there. But for our sake, we need to know that the kidney, like I said, like you said, filters that fluid, removes those toxins. So when you see a dialysis patient, obviously, like what, what's your first gut? Like when as an EMS provider, you have a dialysis patient, probably like this other EMS provider, you're like, OK, I know this brings in other things. Yeah. Is there anything specific off the bat? I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, and I'll admit that because yeah. I didn't have you review this before That's we jumped fine. in here, but it was part of the process. What are what are those things that you that you do think of? Okay, so from a basic level, yeah. I'm thinking they're gonna smell like ammonia, and it smells weird. Okay. Okay. Sure. All right. It's just it, that's how they smell. Okay. Um, they are gonna have weird port shunt things that I might not be able to access and I might need to like do an IV on a different arm or okay. there might be areas of their body that I, I'm not supposed to mess with because that's something for the fancy dialysis stuff. Okay. Right? Good. And then they are prone to, if they don't have their regular dialysis treatment, I'm concerned about them going septic. Okay. Sure. That, sure. Those, those are the kind of the things I think like, Hey, make sure that when was their last dialysis treatment? That's mm-hmm. something I'm going to always ask because if they missed it, Maybe that's the problem. Right. right. Yeah. You know, do exactly you know that, what that other medic did and come to yeah. you and be like, cause dialysis missed. You right. Know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Right. Then, you know, shunts or ports, you know, we, we aren't allowed to access those a lot of times, at least in my local protocol and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. if I want to get access because I'm worried about fluid imbalance, I want to replace fluid or something like that, I might have to do it at a, a different site or, or something a little bit odd. So it's just kind of a nuance there. Um, Perfect. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And those are the things I want to talk about. And I want to, like I said, I want to kind of bro- not broaden our differential, but but highlight a couple of things we want to look at and consider in each patient we have who is on dialysis. Okay. So dialysis is essentially replacing the function of the kidney. So someone who requires dialysis has ha- has chronic kidney disease, so much so that they're now, they not fall into the category of end stage renal disease, right? Mm-hmm. So you've got acute kidney injury, right? So you can have, you know, your kidneys can be damaged and not do as good of a job and function and get in the acute setting. You can get acute kidney injury if you're extremely dehydrated, things like that. 
if you've got other problems like atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease and diabetes, these things can damage your vessels. They damage the vessels that go to your kidneys as well. That can then lead to chronic kidney disease. Now, some people can function fine with chronic kidney disease. Their, fu- their kidney doesn't function as well as it should, mm-hmm. but it functions enough, right? Just like people who have like had heart attacks in the past or have congestive heart failure, their heart doesn't function quite as good as maybe yours or eyes. Eyes? Is that even a word? Yeah, yours or mine? I don't know. Sure. But anyway, it doesn't function as well, but it still functions, right? Yeah. So chronic kidney disease, there's a range, right? There's like stage one, stage two. We're not, we don't have to get into that. But eventually you get to a point, if, if things are left long enough, where your kidneys completely fail. And right? I, I want to jump in quick and just yeah. talk about, you mentioned like arthrosclerosis, you mentioned uh, like, like diabetes. CHF, diabetes, you know, issues like that. I think a lot of times that's what we chalk it up. Like arthrosclerosis, we think about the heart, we t- think about the cardiovascular system, like the kidneys are an essential part of that system too, because they're not just dealing with the fluid balance in the vessels. They're dealing with the not not just how much fluid is in the vessels, but also what's in that fluid, right? Sure. So, if I have cardiac issues and backup of fluid, we're, we're used to talking about CHF, where I, you know I have like um, I have right sided heart failure or left sided heart failure, so I have swollen you know ankles or or I have fluid in my lungs. Like we're able to make that concept pretty clear because of the way that the circulatory system works. But any time that we have pooling of that fluid, as providers, then we want to step in and say, okay, they need help with the elimination of that fluid, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which means they wouldn't need help with the elimination of the fluid if the kidneys weren't overtaxed with trying to get rid of that, right? So that's why we give things like diuretics, like Lasix, you know, they, they help in that loop of Henle that's in the kidney, in the nephron, right? And it helps eliminate that fluid. So I think already we need to start tying in these these concepts that we always chalk up to cardiology because everyone wants to be a cardiologist, like a mini cardiologist out there. But this, also, this is these systems work together. Yeah, right? yeah, and that's the thing too. I think the reason we as EMS and emergency providers focus in on the heart stuff because that's the acute stuff typically, right? Yeah. So if you've got a bunch of plaque buildup and cholesterol buildup in your vessels and you have a heart attack. You could die right right now. Right. We jump in and we take care of that. But the thing is that you don't only have plaque buildup and cholesterol buildup in your coronary vessels. You have it in in all the vessels of your body, including the ones feeding the kidneys. So it's very common for people with atherosclerosis and high cholesterol to develop kidney issues, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're they don't they have the same blockage of flow, decreased perfusion to the kidneys. The other big, you know, you know, contributing factor to chronic kidney disease and eventually end stage renal disease is diabetes. So, you know, diabetes, if you're uncontrolled, so if you've got high glucose levels in your blood for a prolonged period of time, glucose damages vessels, right? Glucose damages the vessels in the eyes, which is why diabetics need to get their eyes checked frequently. It also damages vessels in the kidneys. So diabetics who are uncontrolled also have a tendency to develop chronic kidney disease and eventually end stage renal disease. So those are the big ones. So again, and again, it, it happens over time though. So we as emergency providers typically don't see it until it's the very end, right? We right. see the dialysis patient. Or we make the link in the opposite direction, right? Hey, he's got swollen hands and feet. So that means he's in heart failure. He could have a heart attack. And it's like, no, there's bad things happening in the body right now that like sure. need to be handled. We're just not thinking long term because we're such acute providers. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think like this is an opportunity for us to think about some more chronic issues as well, like chronic kidney disease and things. So so perfect. So those are kind of the big risk factors to develop chronic kidney disease, which eventually ends up you know, in end stage renal disease. So someone who's in end stage renal disease only has a couple choices, right? Their kidneys do no, they, they no longer function, right? They no longer filter out those toxins. They no longer filter the fluid. They either need a kidney transplant, which as you, as people probably know, transplants are rare and difficult to find and, or they need dialysis. So a lot of times they'll go on, they'll go on dialysis. So dialysis basically takes the place of the kidney. And what it's going to do is it's going to, we're going to, basically we're taking the fluid, the blood out of the body, we're filtering it of all the bad stuff, and then we're putting it back in. Just like the kidney would do inside the body, but this is like outside. Exactly. Machine, right. Which is crazy. It's cool. Right. But- it's, it's kind of an amazing thing, right? So there's a couple parts of dialysis. So there's like the machine that actually does the filtering, but there's also a, a fluid within the dialysis that's called dia- dialysate. I don't know if you're familiar with dialysate. So dialysate is basically a, a fluid that... You know, so for instance, we want to pull potassium out of the blood. 
we play with the you know levels of potassium in that fluid so that things diffuse into that fluid and other things go in and it basically mm-hmm. is like a like a, an electrolyte fluid that pulls things out and helps put things back into the blood to, to filter it right because remember fluid balance is always going to be based on on dilution and like like dilution and then the, the just the the rule of the gradient we're always going to move yeah from a, from an area of high concentration to low concentration so right. the bigger particles you know the the sodiums the potassiums when they shift into different areas or, or when our the our cells have pumps that force them into different areas the fluid's then going to move with it in order to naturally dilute it and that's how we can shrink and swell cells it's how we can get fluid into intravascular space or intercellular space and move things around exactly right and that's what dialysis is doing so there's a couple types of dialysis too though so the the one that we know of is hemodialysis right so hemo meaning blood dialysis I mean we're taking the blood out usually through a shunt and then we're filtering it and putting it back in. Mm-hmm. So you had mentioned those shunts earlier. So yeah, what is a shunt? Walk me through it. Okay, so a shunt is essentially a artery and a vein that have been stitched together to form one big solid vessel that's muscular because there's an artery attached, but it's also large because there's a vein attached. And it can allow and accommodate large amounts of fluid, right? So we're, we're pulling all the, bl- literally all the blood out of the body over the course of a couple hours of dialysis a couple times a week yeah. and then filtering it and putting it all back in. So we need a, vi- a big firm vessel that can do so, that. So yeah, the exchange is normally happening at the capillaries, right? Where mm-hmm. the veins and the arteries meet, but it's so microscopic and tiny, it's not like we're going to be able to pull tons of fluid out of the capillary beds. Right, so, like a kidney could. So we basically just graft an artery and a vein together. Now we have a big, large vessel that we can pull. It's, it's about the size. Right, right. right. It's not really about the function because there's things in our body that does that obviously but we want to get enough fluid exactly out in a short period of time. exactly and there's two ways we can do that we can either take the artery and the vein and stitch them together or we can take like an artificial piece of like tubing or it's almost like a plastic tubing and then stitch to that so there's two different ways so there's, there's like a graft where you put a piece in there and stitch to it yeah or there's like the shunt where you you just stitch the two together and now here's a shunt. question that I, I do not know the answer to when they like when those are done, they're done with those. Let's say you were you were being dialysized for months, and then you got a kidney transplant. Things are hunky dory now. Like when they like, do they take those? They take them out, right? They like untie it eventually. No, no, they leave. They leave it. So you just always have a shunt. You just then? always have a shunt there, yeah. So just kind of cool. And that's why these patients will have because it's so much flow through that one vessel. They have yeah. like a thrill. You'll hear the people talk yeah, about you'll a thrill. Feel you'll yeah. feel the turbulent flow of the right, blood, right. and that's why you don't want to put a blood pressure cuff on that arm. You don't want to do an IV on that arm because you don't want to risk blocking that shunt. There's only like a couple places that people can have a shunt, right? It's usually the two two arms. You only got two arms, so if you have a shunt in one arm and it fails, you've got the other arm. You really mm-hmm. want to protect these. So we're not going to do anything that could potentially so crush clot them the off, pressure. right? So, yeah, blood pressure cuff or you know, putting an IV in that arm. And the reason we don't want to do that is because we don't want to put that at any risk of clotting off or, or stopping flow. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if it fails, we've lost that that place to not well, do that. And from my experience, at least, we want to leave that shunt for... It's not like when they get to the ER, you're like, oh, I'll just give all their medications through this shunt. It's so great because it's such great access, right? No, like right you you right. want to leave that for dialysis because yeah, yeah, that's, exactly. that's a life-saving thing. Yeah, We're going to leave it for there. We can get access somewhere else to give drugs Other and things. food. And, and the like thing that. is, too, is that you want to be so careful. You have to access that shunt three times a week, right? Usually right. for like an hour or so, or two hours or so to do this thing. So you start getting scarring as people yeah. like people have these shunts for a prolonged period of time they get they can get scarring it can become harder to access so we really want to as best we can minimize how often we're doing that yeah, in the sense. same way that you know medics out there who are starting IVs or EMTs that work with medic crews they're starting IVs like access over a period of time right if you've got someone especially if someone's like a chronic like a dr- drug abuser or something sure. like needle drug abuser they might have just really difficult veins to access because of scar tissue and buildup, right? So you got to move around and sometimes you got to get get IVs in tougher spots. Same thing happens with these shunts is they can get kind of gnarled and scarred mm-hmm. and, and knotted. Yeah. So we want to try to use that only when we need it for what we need it for. Right, exactly. So people on hemodialysis of what we're describing, they usually go to a clinic three times a week, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or something like that, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever it might be. And they get basically all their blood pulled out and then, and then filtered and all put back in. And, and this is why home. it smells like ammonia at those places because all 
all that dialysate. It, it yeah, smells, the dialysate that's itself. Why, that's why is when you like, walk into a into a dialysis clinic, it kind of it has that like chlorinated ammonia like smell. Like that, it smells like a cleaning solution. Almost. Yeah, right. Because that's yeah. what you're doing. You're almost like kind of cleaning the blood out that way. So the other type of dialysis that you can have is peritoneal dialysis, and this is kind of a crazy one to me. So peritoneal dialysis is where instead of um, using a machine as the filtering mechanism, you use the peritoneal space. So this is what's crazy. So these people, and this has to be done every day. So this this can only be done for patients who are very reliable, who who are able to perform this on themselves or have the support to do this. Yeah, so they do it on their own. They don't have to go to a clinic. They right. can stay at home and perform right. it on themselves. But they have to do it every day. Yeah. So that's the kind of the difference there. So it, it, it it's really dependent on... You know what the patient can tolerate, what they can handle. Yeah, you know that's patient sort of education so, and exactly. the lifestyle and resources available to them. Exactly, know. exactly. So in peritoneal dialysis, they literally they're given the dialysate, they're given that solution, and they inject it into their abdomen. Okay, so like where all your organs are floating around, you inject it into there. The bot, the peritoneal space, the body absorbs because there's a gradient, right? You put a fluid in there. Right pulls out the potassium out of the blood and out of the organs and things like that. And then they withdraw that fluid, which is now has all the bad stuff in it. Oh, geez. Do which they, is kind is of crazy. Is it or is it just an... It's just, they just, just into the... Yeah, like, like into a, the wall. Like a, almost like a diabetic like injection. Yeah, it's not like sub-Q, though. It's right not, it's not yeah. in the muscle. It's like literally down into the oh, space, man. right? Into into the abdominal wall. That's crazy. Into the abdominal space. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So that's peritoneal dialysis. So those patients, obviously, are going to be at risk of things like peritonitis infection right anytime you're injecting into that abdominal space sure because you're yep. so those patients you if someone's on peritoneal dialysis one of the things you really have to be careful do they have a rigid abdomen do they have a painful abdomen do they have a fever because that can be very life-threatening yeah so that's and that's kind of a side note i throw that one in there peritoneal dialysis is usually not the one we think of when we think of our patients yeah. on dialysis we usually think of hemodialysis and then finally the third dialysis type of therapy that we will sometimes encounter which you really you're only going to encounter in the icu um so you may not as an an EMS provider, but I think it's a good one to know about is something called CRRT, which is continuous renal replacement therapy. So sometimes when people in the ICU, obviously they're, they're in multi-organ failure, their kidneys are part of that, they're failing. They may not need dialysis forever. They just need to get through this period of time where they're super sick. So we can almost do this like daily therapy dialysis, but CRRT is again, continuous renal replacement therapy. So they get hooked up and because they're super sick, they can't tolerate huge fluid shifts that we would normally do with in, in dialysis. We can't take all their blood out and put it back in. Their blood pressure and all the kind of stuff can't handle yeah. that. So it's just this almost like picture like dialysis just 24-7, right? They're hooked up to a machine yeah. 24-7 and slowly their and blood it's not is as, always... it's not as fast or as much because like, like you said, right. in dialysis, a couple hours, I filtered yeah. my entire blood. So it's going to be a slower rate. Yeah, you're constant. filtering the blood over like 24 hours like the body would yeah. through a kidney. But and this is kidney, like if their kidneys are taxed because of, like you said, they're in the ICU, right? So right. Their, their kidneys are... Failing. Not necessarily, not necessarily, they're not struggling from like end stage renal disease, but their kidneys are failing from something else. Toxins that they were exposed to, right. major trauma because they're breaking down. Sepsis, you know, burn, organ sepsis, failure. Sepsis, yeah, burns, like that. that sort of thing. So basically, it's almost like putting that, it's put, we put their lungs on a ventilator yeah. to breathe, for to give their lungs a break. It's almost like putting their kidneys on CRRT to give their kidneys a break yeah. so they can heal. So their kidneys aren't dying. Like or, or dead, they don't have dead tissue in their kidneys like a lot of people do when they're in like actual renal failure end stage disease. But they are so overtaxed. They're on their way, right? Yeah, We're trying like to we don't want that. their kidneys to actually fail, exactly. and then they'd have to be in dialysis for the rest of their life. Exactly. Right? So exactly. So so just kind of a an overview picture of the different types of dialysis. But the the big one that we focus in on, especially in in, in EMS, and the one you guys are familiar with from an emergency standpoint is hemodialysis, right? And even in from a, if you're a transporting EMT, like when I when I worked in transport and I was just an, was an EMT and I just did transport, I didn't do any rescue stuff, like. I would say 70% of my job for this private ambulance company I worked for was just taking people from their homes to dialysis. Sure. Appointments. Yeah, like, yeah. like that's like when you like boots on the ground, your first job a lot of times in EMS is I'm taking people back and forth to dialysis. And I guess even now, like it's amazing to me that I just didn't really know what I was doing. You know, right, like yeah, I was no, just, yeah. I was, you know, you we, do we get upset when people are like, you just drive an ambulance, but I kind of was just driving an ambulance because I didn't really have a deeper understanding. I could have handled something with their airway or something mm -hmm. if something happened, and that's why they want me there. But I think learning about this kind of stuff, I wish I would have known this stuff then because it would have made me a little bit more prepared 
you know, yeah, a yeah. little bit more involved in what I was really taking yeah. part in, which is a really important part of medical care is making sure that these patients are monitored and getting uh-huh. getting to dialysis on time and going back and forth. So Absolutely. All right, so something we've hinted at a bunch here is that, like, with hemodialysis, we're taking all the blood out of the body, and we're putting it all back in. So we're, huge amounts of fluid shifts, right? So as an EMS provider, as a medic, when you get called to a dialysis center to treat a patient, right? So if someone's getting dialysis, and all of a sudden they need to call EMS, which is going to happen to our listeners a lot, what is typically the complaint? So we get a lot of shortness of breath and blood pressure issues, mm-hmm. mainly because the dialysis staff can't keep people on dialysis if there's blood pressure. If their blood pressure has to be a certain amount. They have to be perfusing well. They have to have good oxygenation. They have to be. It has to be very stable in order for them to continue the treatment. Right. And then the complication, like I, I had just last cycle, I had uh, a patient who was like midway. They had they had access the port. There's a huge needle, and he got so unstable so quickly that they had to cut access that, that takes time mm-hmm. and it ta- it would have taken the staff they told us like probably 15 20 minutes to remove the needle and get everything kind of cleaned up and good to go and he just didn't have that kind of time so they ended up just sort of like taping the needle to him and pulled what they could and we rolled on from there oh wow. so it's just complicated they're kind of constantly checking yeah. these patients and making sure so they'll be very sensitive to even small changes in blood pressure sure. like you know a l- little bit high a little bit low they're they're really watching that because of what they deal yeah. with. You know? And that makes sense, right? So like this is starting to kind of all come together now. So we know what we're doing. We know we're removing all the blood and filtering it. So that's the, these fluid shifts. Obviously, if you have these huge fluid shifts in the body, it's going it to potentially affect blood pressure, right? Which is why a lot of times you're going to have these patients say, hey, their blood pressure dropped. We had to take them off dialysis. They come to the emergency department. Or they get fluid overload or fluid issues in their lungs, pulmonary edema, and they develop shortness of breath and things like this. So during dialysis, and not even during it, but like we get these large fluid shifts. And we get it for a couple of reasons. One, because we're moving fluid around, right? Mm-hmm. But also because of, we talked about that electrolyte gradient. If you've got, if you're off in how you're establishing the gradient, maybe more fluid gets pulled in than it should, or more fluid gets pulled out, right? So the every day or every other day when they're getting this done, they can get these large fluid shifts, which is why we're going to see blood pressure issues and shortness of breath issues. But then that becomes really difficult for me, right? So another big question. So you, you said earlier, like one question you have to ask is when was your last dialysis, right? Mm-hmm. Cause if we've missed dialysis, that's We know that that can cause problems, which we'll talk about in a second. But the other thing is, is if you're responding to someone who's been taken off dialysis because their blood pressure dropped, I need to know how much of dialysis they finished. Yeah. Because if you come to me and you're on dialysis and your blood pressure dropped in the dialysis center and I've got someone with low blood pressure, my initial intervention is what? Give them fluids. Give them fluids. Yeah. Well, but how much fluids do I give someone who's on dialysis who can't filter that fluid? Right. So they're going to either need dialysis again and, tomorrow. And how, much, how much toxins did we take out? Did we take out 50% of the toxins? Did we take out 75% of the toxins? Like, right. And... So, so because of that concentration gradient, you're dumping just clear isotonic fluid Normal into them, saline, right. right? And then is that fluid going to rush to all these areas that are have high toxicity and high pressure gradient right. because of the concentration of those those electrolytes, right? Exactly. So it becomes really different. So that's one thing I've always struggled with as an ER doctor. I think there's no right answer here. It's a balance game. It's that hemostasis that we talked about before, trying to help the body get to that place where it needs to be. But I might, you know, if I know that they were almost done with dialysis or finished off dialysis, then I, I assume they can, they can maybe use 250 cc's, 500. That's not gonna, that's not gonna put them into fluid overload. Right. But if they had just started dialysis, there's a component of fluid overload to start with. Every time you enter dialysis, you, you're fluid overloaded because right. your body's never filtered any out over the last couple of days. Yeah. So I don't really want to give them more fluid in that regard. So then I got to find other ways to bring the blood pressure up. So again, it can be this, and there's, there's not really an answer here, but I'm just painting this picture of like it can be really difficult to manage these patients because we're artificially basically being the kidneys through dialysis well and the the same goes for fluid balances that we deal with a little bit more like in the field if we know someone is on a diuretic right let's say they're they're not end stage renal disease but their kidneys are at at some they're not at optimum level because of their issues with CHF or their mm-hmm. issues with their cardi, you know, their cardiovascular issues or atherosclerosis, mm-hmm. what, whatever is going on, diabetes, and then so they're on something that helps them pee, right? <laughs> like right, it, right. It's, it's a it's a diuretic. It makes them go more, right? right? If we're not using a potassium sparing diuretic when we give that, right? Which, so it doesn't keep the potassium in. 
we don't we lose too much fluid a lot of times mm-hmm. or we lose too little fluid so like these fluid shifts we have to be very concerned about like oh shoot i might need to dump fluid in them just to keep them alive but if that fluid doesn't have any electrolytes in it where's it going to go right right and again there's no necessarily like right answer there right it's, right. it's all this balance game and you're, and you're checking their blood levels and you're doing this kind of stuff so so that's the first so i mean i think we've already touched on the first thing we need to look at and consider in dialysis patient is fluid shifts and fluid overload right so these patients are going to be very prone to fluid overload because their kidneys are not functioning they're not filtering out fluid and the takeaway here to like, to bring it back to basics yeah. from a from a emergency responder for those of you that are on the road you're not Chris is talking right now about the complication of maintaining this balance in the ER. We are fortunate a little bit that we don't have to worry about that so much. And the, the answer to low blood pressure will always initially be fluid. So we will be giving fluid. But I think what we're trying to get at here is don't just open a full bag, full mm-hmm. open, and go mm-hmm. nuts with fluid. You you have to really be monitoring them as you give them fluid because this could shift in the other direction very quickly, right? You could go from, hey, he's hypotensive. I need to give him fluid to, to increase his blood pressure to I gave him too much fluid and now he's drowning, right? Right. And that's not, and then like I said, assessing, and I need to, honestly, anytime we're giving someone fluids, we probably should be frequently listening to their lungs to make sure there's no signs of pulmonary edema, but even more so in dialysis patients, right? right? Because those fluid shifts can happen so quickly. So in dialysis patients, you want to think about fluid overload. So mainly pulmonary edema is the one that you want to be on the lookout for. If it rushes to the lungs and floods the lungs out, we're going right. to have breathing issues. Or if you have someone who sh- shows up with shortness of breath, that's that's your that's your chief complaint, and they're right? on dialysis. You're thinking, okay, this this makes sense. I get why they might have that. They haven't filtered out any fluids for a couple days. Maybe they're due for dialysis, or maybe they missed dialysis, things like that. So that's the one big one. So fluid overload is one big you know thing we need to be on the lookout for on dialysis patients. The other ones we've also talked about, and it's the buildup of toxins, right? Mm-hmm. So so the, the main toxins, and, and there there are plenty, right? There's lots of them. I'm not going to cover all of them, but the the three main toxins I guess I want to talk about would be potassium and um, uric acid. Okay, so potassium is inside of our cells, correct? Mm-hmm. So what's usually on the outside of our cells? Sodium. Sodium, and the inside of the cells is potassium. So when we metabolize, right, when, when we break down things and we're doing metabolism, we're releasing, we're, you know, cells die, and they, that potassium gets released into the bloodstream. So that potassium be, becomes one of the major things we have to filter out, mm-hmm. and that's what the kidneys do. They filter out potassium. Now, you referenced potassium-sparing diuretics. We don't want to filter out too much potassium either, right? But right. we need to get rid of potassium. So yeah. and it's all about a balance, right? right. Which yeah. is why like I want to be careful like when we talk about like waste product, like potassium's important just in the body in general. Yeah. Like you can be you can be low potassium and that's a big yeah. issue. So it's not necessarily like don't think of it as a bad guy, right? right. It's just too much of anything is a bad thing. Exactly. Right? And it's a byproduct. It's one of these byproducts of metas- metabolism, right? Yeah. Is is potassium mm-hmm. so um so potassium is one of the big things we need to filter out so someone who's missed dialysis may have signs of hyperkalemia right too, too much. much hyper too much potassium or kalemia so again what is that going to look like though so we know that that makes sense now because we understand what dialysis is doing but what is hyperkalemia how is hyperkalemia going to present typically in an er situation or an emergency situation it's going to be we're going to look at we need to look at our EKG, right? It can cause peak you know, T waves if it's waves. really extreme though, you know. Yeah, that's... if it's really extreme, but like the, these electrolyte balances become an issue. So hyper high potassium can be a problem, right? So that's one of the reasons that we need dialysis. So that's another thing we need to consider in patients who are on dialysis is high potassium levels, hyperkalemia. We probably should be checking an EKG, right? Do they have signs of irritability irritability in their heart from high potassium? The other big one is uric acid. So urine we, the reason it's called urine is because it's made up of urea, which is a breakdown product of metabolism. So, like when we metabolize things, our bodies breaks it down into urea. Our kidneys do. Our kidneys do, right? Our <laughs> so body, I say our bodies. Yeah, our kidneys break down into urea. Well, if we can't urinate out that urea, right, it just sits in our bloodstream, and that that is a byproduct. That is a toxin. So people can get uremia, which is basically, you know too much urea in the or uric acid in the blood Mm -hmm. and anytime you have a lot of toxins in the blood you can get confusion all right so so alter mental status like that patient i presented in the beginning alter mental status is something else we need to look for and it's because of you can get this your your uric acid and uremia buildup um 
which can lead to confusion. So the next time my brother tries to test you at a hospital when you're just trying to do your job and you're like, hey, I think they have an altered mental status. And he's like, well, why do they have an altered mental status? You just need to respond with because there's too much toxins in their system. Right. And, and I'll like, shut I, up and go home. I promise I wasn't trying to like <laughs> quiz this guy. I was just I just I was just asking because you know, yeah. I was thinking through it myself as well. But but that was why that is that answer. Right. And I don't even know if I had that answer that time. But that answer is he may have uremia. He may have this buildup of uric acid or, or urea in the blood. And then the, all of these toxins, so uric acid and potassium, you know, and, you know, CO2, which is also a byproduct, they're all acids, yeah. right? They're all acids in our body. So acidosis is another huge thing we need to look for in our patients. Signs and that just means they have a low pH, right? They have a low pH mm -hmm. versus a high pH. Right, exactly. And obviously acidosis, our body needs to stay in a certain level of pH in order to function. If we get too far out of that range, we get too acidotic then we can run into issues. Mm -hmm. So sign, we, don't, we don't have to get into like signs of acidosis, but the, the big thing you're going to look for for acidosis, if you've got a bunch of acid buildup in your blood, your body tries to get rid of that acid by hyperventilating, mm -hmm. by breathing off CO2, which is an acid, tries to breathe off as much as it can to bring the pH down, or sorry, bring the pH up, yeah. right? So again, evaluate on our patients for hyperventilation signs of acidosis well, and then like that. and then high levels of acid or really any high levels of electrolytes or low levels of electrolytes make patients more prone to going into cardiac arrhythmias too which mm -hmm. is why you mentioned earlier like not just to check for pt waves but to check to see is this messing up the electrical function of the heart in general because they're at a higher risk now to all of a sudden jump into something nasty looking exactly exactly so so that's pretty much it i mean that pretty much sums up so Really what you're seeing is that when you have these dialysis patients, we're going to look for fluid overload. We're going to look for cardiac like arrhythmias and irritability because of the toxin buildup. And confusion is another big one, right? We're so, so really heart, lungs, altered mental status, our ABCs. It, it, yeah. We see now why in dialysis patients we need to do the same thing as we do with anybody because they can have these signs and symptoms and right. these conditions. So really quick before we end. The other, you know, sometimes you'll see this on exams and stuff, what I like to throw this in here, is the indications for emergent dialysis. So a patient who needs dialysis immediately, and the mnemonic is A-E-I-O-U, all right? So A, acidosis, we talked about that. If you're, if you're extremely acidotic, you might need dialysis, even if you're not already on dialysis. Sometimes mm -hmm. patients just, we put patients on emergent dialysis in order to clear the acid out to try to keep them to survive. E is electrolyte issues, right? And we talked about the main one being hyperkalemia. Um, calcium can be another one, but that's, you know, the hyperkalemia, the potassium is the big one. We want We're to not going to be able to see which one it is, right? Right. But, but the, the solution is often the same. It's, it's that hyperventilation mm -hmm. to breathe off the acid. Right, right, right. So you got acidosis, A. E is electrolyte disturbances. I is intoxication. So certain, I'm not talking about alcohol use, but like methanol, uh, aspirin overdoses. Some of these overdoses like can throw you into such bad kidney issues that you need emergent dialysis to dialyze off those toxins. That too much toxins for the kidneys to handle in an acute period, so they're gonna right. It's gonna damage the kidneys if we don't do something. Right. Yeah. And then O is overload. Overload. Fluid overload. Okay. Yes. We talked about right away. Perfect. Right. So one I forgot. forgot. <laughs> right. So fluid. Oh, so O for overload. Fluid overload. If they're too overloaded, they might need emergent dialysis. And then so A E I O U. And we already talked about this too, uremia, all right? So they're, they're crazy confusion. We get their levels and their urea is way too high. The uric acid is way too high. Sometimes these patients need emergent dialysis as well. So makes sense? Makes sense. It's a little more. One thing I do want yeah. to touch on real quick is just I hope no one took away from this when someone's got a low blood pressure and they're on dialysis to not give them fluid because they're scared of giving them too much fluid and fluid overloading, okay? Like do your job. Follow yeah. your protocol. Just all we're trying to do is tell you to have a healthy caution in the way that you treat. That That's it. I'm not trying to – because sometimes people want to see it black and white, and they mm -hmm. want to say, okay, I'm never going to get fluid now because that could get them in trouble too. Well, they're in trouble now, right? We, yeah, we have yeah, to yeah. help. Just Very good point. Just watch it, assess it, constantly be reassessing. this. All, a lot of this stuff is just to teach us – why we need to reassess so often mm -hmm. and what we need to reassess and then what kind of information I need to give you at the ER, right? Yeah, absolutely. So no, definitely give your fluid when they're hypotensive, but as you're giving fluid, just continuously reassess and, and be prepared for possible fluid overload or a possible shift in the other direction. Just right. be ready for it. That's all. Exactly. Cool. So hopefully this helped you guys a little bit under, understand dialysis a little bit better kind of give you uh, some stuff to look for in your dialysis patients beyond just uh, getting to the hospital. I think they missed dialysis. There's a problem here. Why, why we, why this is important and the different things to look for. Um, 
yeah so again we don't have a sponsor today unless we can use saint patrick himself since we're shooting this on saint patrick's day it's but good, uh happy belated saint patrick's day everybody and we appreciate you taking the time to listen or watch uh again you can watch these on youtube or listen to them on uh, your favorite podcast streaming so take a look at both of those we appreciate you guys listening and we will see you next time yeah don't forget the next time you pee to thank your kidneys because they they do good work sure there you go perfect stay sweet all right bye Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're an EMT or medic student or an advanced EMT student or an instructor of those students, we have a program just for you. With Sights and Sirens NREMT prep program, you get video lectures over 15 hours of really vetted, great content to help you through your program and help you prepare for the test. Check it out at www.sightsandsirens.com.